Okay, let's take a look at a flawed descriptive weakening question, starting with the question stem. The union member's argument is most vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that it does something. So notice a couple of things. We're told that there is an argument here. Okay, this is just a given. On top of that, this argument is not the best argument. We are straight up told that the argument is vulnerable to criticism. Okay, so again, that's just a given. What's left for us to figure out is why this argument is vulnerable to criticism. On the grounds that, meaning because the it refers to the argument, right? Because the argument, notice once again, these are all verbs. The argument failed to consider something. That's why the argument is weak. Oh, no, 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 no. It's the argument failed to define something. That's why it's weak. And C's like, no, no, no. It's because the argument failed to consider this thing. That's why the argument is weak. And D's like, well, you guys are all wrong. It's because the argument took for granted something else. And that's why the argument is weak. And E is like, no, it's because the argument failed to establish something. And that's why the argument is weak. Okay, this is the level at which we're having to make our decision. Notice it's very similar to method of reasoning in that it's high level descriptive, right? You can see it, it's, a, it's almost like you have a panel of commentators from up on high looking down at this argument and talking about the argument, critiquing the argument, right? Rather than back in weakening, strengthening questions, you were just in the mud, right? You were just fighting, right? The answer choices directly impacted the argument. Okay, so also just like the method of reasoning questions, the first question we want to ask of each of these answer choices is, are you even descriptively accurate? So first, let's take a look at this argument, and then we'll consider each answer in turn. The union member says, some members of our labor union are calling for immediate strike. So right out the gate, classic LR stimuli form, right? Where our author is referencing other people's position. Okay, other people's position. What's the other people's position? Strike right now. That's the context. And unsurprisingly, we have a but, which introduces our argument, our meaning the we're the union member, right? Uh, our argument with a conclusion indicator, right? Premise, conclusion. This is pretty common in these high-level questions, method of reasoning, flaw questions. They don't try very hard to hide the conclusion because they know the difficulty resides here. What is the reasoning? Well, the union member says a strike would cut into our strike fund. Well, that makes sense, right? To, to have a strike, you've got to spend money. So you have a strike fund. So yes, doing a strike would sap some of that fund. And in addition, would lead to a steep fine. Oh, okay, we will also get a fine. So both of these things would cause us to suffer major financial loss. Fine, okay, so we lose money, right? You see, the union member offers two reasons that can be jointly described as a major financial loss. That's the reason given for, oh, don't strike now, right? which is in contrast to the other people who want an immediate strike. Our union member says, don't strike now. We must not strike now. Why? Because major financial loss. Okay, I mean, what do you, I don't, I generally don't know how to respond to these types of arguments where you know, it's very similar to weakening, right, and strengthening, where the reasoning is just like, yeah, I guess, right, there's some support, major financial loss, bad, right, yeah, I get that, so don't strike now, but, you know, I'm thinking, I, that's just so limited, I'm certainly not 100% sold on this conclusion, right, but I also don't perceive a reasoning error, in other words, a flaw in the reasoning. We'll contrast this question with the next question, which does have a flaw in the reasoning, which means that there's no support at all flowing from the premise to the conclusion. Here, that's not the case. There is some support flowing from the premise to the conclusion. Major financial loss, bad. Okay, so that's a reason not to strike. Right? It's not a dispositive reason. It doesn't guarantee the truth of this conclusion, but it's some support. Do you see what I mean? So, okay, so in that way, when the question stem is phrased, like, argument is vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that they leave open the possibility that you're not dealing with a flaw in the reasoning, rather you're just dealing with some kind of weakness in the reasoning. And we'll apply our two-step test. Step one is descriptive accuracy. Step two is that you have to be describing the relevant part of the argument, namely the vulnerable part of the argument. A says, this argument is vulnerable to criticism because the argument fails to consider, right, fails to consider that a strike might cause the union to suffer financial loss even if no fine or imposed. Meaning, look, here's a consideration. You strike, 
you might cause the union to suffer financial loss, even if there were no fine, right? And meaning, take away this fine, take away this fine, right? Let's just imagine we're in a world where there's no such thing as a fine for striking, okay? Even in that world, your striking might still cause the union to suffer financial loss. That's a consideration. Did you consider that? Or did you forget to consider that? See, I'm looking back at this argument, I'm thinking, uh, I, I feel like the union member not only considered it, but rather explicitly stated it. Because didn't she say here, like right here, a strike would cut into our strike fund, right? As a separate thing from this fine. I mean, and how am I supposed to interpret cut into our strike fund if not as a financial loss? I mean, a strike fund is about money, right? Cut into has to be negative. So negative money. Do, do you see what I mean? Like it's very difficult to give an interpretation of answer choice A to meet this, oh, this argument failed to consider it. So as such, I think answer choice A is descriptively inaccurate. No, the argument did not fail to consider this. Okay, so answers like this tend to be easier to eliminate than, well, we'll see, right? Not all answers are like this. A lot of these other answers, the uh, trap with the wrong ones, that are the ones that are very trappy, right? very attractive, they pass step one. For example, B fails to define adequately what constitutes a major financial loss. I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, hold on a second. You said cause us to suffer major financial loss. You didn't say what that means. You didn't, I mean, forget adequately. You just straight up didn't define. I mean, adequately, inadequately, you didn't define in any way what constitutes a major financial loss. See, descriptively accurate. Oh, B must be the right answer. This is where this type of question, flawed descriptive weakening, is distinguished from method of reasoning. If we were doing simply method of reasoning, that would have been enough. If you're descriptively accurate, you're the right answer. If you're descriptively inaccurate, you're the wrong answer. Here, we are in flawed descriptive weakening territory. Two-step test. Descriptive accuracy is only step one. And if you step back and think about this for a second, look at how short this argument is. The union member gives us five lines of text, nearly two lines of which is actually devoted to what other people are saying. I mean, how much can she possibly consider in just five lines of text? Only so much. In fact, a very limited amount. So if you're going to phrase critiques in the mold of, oh, you are failing to consider something, you're failing to define, you're failing, most of these are going to be right in terms of descriptive accuracy. Like, look, I can come up with an answer choice right now. The union member failed to consider what I had for lunch today. Descriptively accurate, the union member didn't say anything about the delicious lunch I just had. But that doesn't make it right, because that's not why the argument is vulnerable to criticism. And that's where step two of the test comes in. Now we have to ask ourselves of answer choice B. Sure, the union member did not de uh, define at all, forget adequately or inadequately, did, did not define at all what, cost, uh, what constitutes financial loss. But is that the reason why this premise is only weak support for the conclusion? Another way to think about that is to ask yourself, had the union member adequately defined what constitutes a major financial loss, would that have made the argument that much better? I think the answer is no. Right? I mean, the argument struck me as weak, not because you didn't, you know, flesh out what do you, well, what do you really mean by how much money are we really talking about here? Right? It's like, okay, I, that hardly matters. It's a major financial loss, whatever that means. It's some significant amount of money are getting a more fine-grained picture, right? A, a sharper, higher resolution picture of just exactly what amount of money we're talking about hardly will make, will improve the argument, right? Do you see what I mean? Like, perhaps a little bit. I'm not saying it's entirely irrelevant, but to say that to, to characterize this as the most vulnerable part of the argument is too much of a stretch. And I think you'll see that as soon as you consider, well, either this answer choice or this answer choice. Both will turn the spotlight of your attention onto the other failings of the argument, okay? So B is one of these trap answer choices that is descriptively accurate, but is not describing the reason why the argument is most vulnerable to criticism. C says, fails to consider that the benefits to be gained from a strike might outweigh the cost. You see how this is descriptively accurate? Yeah, you only talk about the costs. Both of these are cost number one, cost number two, described together is a you know, major financial cost. You didn't talk about the benefits. Definitely descriptively accurate and potentially describing exactly where the flaw is. So this sounds pretty good. I'm going to keep this one around. And now let's consider D. Takes for granted that the most important factor in the labor union's bargaining position is the union's financial strength. Here the phrasing is different. Up to this point, it's, also, it's all about like sort of the argument failed to consider this, failed to consider that. 
Here, D is saying, oh, your argument is weak because you took for granted something. You assumed something. You made, you made an assumption, right? You made an assumption that the most and more important than anything else, the most important factor in, in your bargaining position is, is your financial strength, right? You union member assumed that. I'm not even sure this is descriptively accurate. Did the argument assume this? I can say for sure that the argument, you know, took for granted that one factor to consider. I, I don't. I mean, I suppose it's about it's about bargaining position, right? Fine. I, I don't. I don't want to fight on this. So I can see the point, right? One factor in the labor union's bargaining is union's financial strength. Okay, then that would be like descriptively accurate. Definitely, that's one factor. Otherwise, why are you talking about it? The fact that you're talking about it means you assume that it's one factor, perhaps perhaps even important factor, because you talk about it, right? I'll, I'll even concede that point. But to say that it's assuming that's the most important factor, come on. How do we know that? How do we know that the union member doesn't think that some non-financial factor is more important when it comes to the labor union's bargaining position? How do we know it's not the fact that we can organize collective action that's more important than the financial I mean, if, after all, that's what a strike is. Do you see what I mean? So D has a hard time, like A, passing the, the descriptive accuracy test. Now, if D was attractive to you, I would just warn you to be careful about conflating a reason mentioned for being the most important reason. Just because a reason was mentioned doesn't necessarily mean that it's the most important reason. Now, finally, on to E, which says, fails to establish that there will be a better opportunity strike at a later time. And immediately, just like C, I think you get the MB as well, you get the feeling that, yeah, that's true. Hey, you know, union member, you say we must not strike now, right? Because you're contradicting your other fellow members who's calling for immediate strike. But you didn't establish, you failed to establish that tomorrow will be a better time to strike or next month will be a better uh, time to strike. So descriptively accurate. And now you're also thinking, okay, I remember this is not method of reasoning. This is flawed descriptive weakening, two-step test. It also has to describe the flaw. And yeah, I think it does describe the flaw. But isn't, isn't, I mean, the conclusion here about we must not strike now, doesn't that presume that there is some better opportunity to strike at a later time? And it's precisely for failure to actually show that there will be a, precise, a better opportunity to strike at a later time that this argument fails, is vulnerable to criticism, right? So, so it must be answer choice E. No, not at all. And in fact, you kind of just fell for a trap. Remember now, this is theory, right? We are talking about an argument, which has a premise and a conclusion and a support structure that flows from the premise to the conclusion. Our job is to describe the vulnerability here, not to say why you might disagree with this. Okay, I'll say that again. Our job is to describe the vulnerability here, not to just play, come up with a reason why you can disagree with the conclusion. Those are two completely distinct things. They're adjacent, they're related, and they're similar. I know it's hard to like separate them in, in, because in normal day conversation, when you have arguments over issues that you care about, like all those things get conflated, right? But here, when you're doing the LSAT, when you're doing flawed descriptive weakening questions, you're doing argument analysis. You don't want to, I, I kind of think of this as, as falling into the trap of caring too much. Like you care too much about the union members. You care too much about the actual strike, right? You're imagining yourself to be a union member and like this affects you. And but you know, like, no, it's really not that. You don't care about the union members. You don't care about the strike. What you care about is the argument. You care about the reasoning. You care about the reasons offered, the premises offered to support the conclusion and What's wanting here? What's lacking here? What's weak here? Notice that answer choice E could be a response regardless of what the premise is. I'll say that again. This is super important. Answer choice E is a response you can give to the union member in complete disregard of her premises, of her reasoning. Imagine she just says something like this. Some members of our labor union are calling for a media strike but we must, not, we must not strike now. And you can say, well, you failed to establish there'd be a better time to strike at a later time. Yeah, that's right. That's a response. And that may well be a response you might offer to this union member if you were part of her union and you were aligned with these other members. But that's not at all what we are doing. You're not part of the union. You're not actually having a debate over when you should strike. Should you strike at all? Instead, you are doing argument analysis. I know I keep saying this phrase, but, and it's really in the hopes that slowly you'll start to truly understand what it means to do argument analysis. E is not doing argument analysis. C is. Look at the reasoning that's actually been given. 
These are cost considerations. C says, "Yeah, okay, you make these cost considerations, but you fail to consider the benefits that might be gained and whether those benefits might outweigh the costs." That describes why this argument is weak. Do you see how intimately tied to the reasoning, to the premise given in support of the conclusion, answer choice C is, and how completely divorced from it answer choice E is. Put in another way, E brings up chronological concerns, right? Time concerns. Not now, when. Which is a reasonable question to ask if your job is to figure out: Are we striking now or later? This is a totally reasonable question to ask. But that's not our job. Our job isn't to decide whether we strike now or later. Our job is to identify the vulnerability in the argument given. Do you, do you see that distinction? It's the distinction between doing argument analysis and pretending you're a union member trying to figure out whether to strike. This is the trap, the psychological trap of getting you to care too much and forget what you're actually supposed to be doing. E, while it's true, passes step one, descriptive accuracy, does not pass step two. This is not the reason why these premises give weak support to the conclusion. C is the reason why. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time, I think, in some ways, just repeating why E isn't right and C is right, and the contrast between C and E. And the reason why I'm doing this is because this type of trap is incredibly psychologically appealing. So if you either chose E or were even hesitant between C and E, I really, really, really cannot stress this enough. Really, want you to understand both the psychological appeal of answer choice E, and I mean that you need to understand why E is attractive, because only then can you articulate to yourself why E isn't the right answer, why E isn't doing argument analysis. Otherwise, the next time you encounter this trap, and I promise you, there will be plenty of next times. You're either going to fall for the trap again, or you're going to waste valuable time being indecisive between E and the correct answer.